God's people say, Amen. 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 As the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our God shall stand forever. There was a time that when hard times came upon your life, it was just considered normal. There was a time that if someone fell into financial concerns, that it wasn't seen out of the ordinary. There was a time that when people had health issues or some type of concerns, that it was part of just living, amen? But now we have gone into a period that any slight discomfort is not even normal no more. Sometimes we, we experience discomfort and we, we tend to think that something terrible has just happened to us. But the one thing we have to realize and understand that when discomfort comes, encouragement is soon coming after. Just because something bad happens into your life doesn't mean that the world is going to end. Amen. So with that, I say stop your drooping. That's the title for this sermon. Stop your drooping. When we look at this passage in Hebrews, we come to an understanding that the writer, which I believe is Paul, has just gone through a litany of trying to get the reader to understand what true faith really is. In chapter 11, he identified a number of individuals that had gone through life and life's perils and still made it through. How many know that you can make it through? Now, when you look at those cloud of witnesses that was in chapter 11, and we're going to talk about them throughout this process. The one thing they did not do was give up. Genuine faith will have you persevere. And to be very honest, that's what this whole theme of this chapter is. is about perseverance and endurance. When you see things happening in your life, don't think it's strange when these times come upon you. The Bible says there shall be wars and rumors of war. The Bible says that mothers shall be against daughters and fathers against sons. That even some of your troubles will come out of your own household. The previous revelation of access to God's realm will become the basis and the ability to persevere against any type of persecution. Realize and understand that this is not a mandate to just give up. If we here in the church, we have to learn, and to those that have come before us, that no matter what, we must stand the storm. I'm just reminded of some times in my life that if I had given up, I would not be here today. See, I, I don't know about you, but I know what it's like to have gone hungry. Amen. I know what it's like to have gone with not even two nickels in my pocket to rub together. Amen. I know what it's like to want a meal and not know where the next meal is coming from. Amen. Amen. And when you when you have gone through some things, that makes you a little bit stronger. Amen. See, sometimes I think since we are in this give it to me right now generation, we have forgotten what it takes to make it through. See, that's why I, I don't just give my children whatever they want. If my grandchild wants something, I said, you got to get over here and do something for it. He said, but I asked you to give it. I said, yeah, but I'm asking you to give too. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes going through the storm makes you stronger, amen? The necessity of this is that we get a closer relationship with God. Here's point number one. Time to straighten up. Right. That's point number one. Did y'all hear what I said? Yeah. Time to straighten up. Right. Did your mother or father say, if you don't straighten up, mm. mm -hmm. y'all know what came behind that? Yeah. <laughs> My mother said, well, you act up, that's why I'm going to straighten you up. Right. Uh -huh. There wasn't going to be no one. Two, three, there were no timeouts. 
It was one boom, boom. I just got straightened up, y'all. Boom. And it wasn't all this talk back that some of these kids do today. But uh, can we go home, y'all? See, see, you ain't gonna, gonna, gonna say anything to me and then expect for me to feed you, too. Amen. Not my child. Uh, my child, 34 years old, the oldest thing I get. And the one thing I say, you can say whatever you want, but when you say it, say it with some respect. I remember I was talking to my child one day and I, and I, and I said, now baby, if you don't want daddy to get on you, you might want to stop that. And she just kept on, she said, and she kept on. And I said, now daddy gonna straighten you up in a minute. And she looked at me, he, he, he. Uh-huh. Then when I went over there, she said, Daddy, I'm straightening up. I'm straightening up. <laughs> Don't let it be said too late that when you have the time to straighten everything out, you do not take that opportunity. Yeah. This verse is taken from the cry of the prophet Isaiah in the 35th chapter around the third verse. It's composed of the word lift up. Literally means to straighten up. See, you don't lift somebody up to get them straightened up to tear them back down. See, some people think that their encouragements are good, but some folks don't know how to encourage. Some folks don't know how to be lifted up. Sometimes it's said with so much anger and animosity, but they say, I'm just telling you for your own good. If that's the kind of encouragement you have, keep it to yourself. When Jesus encouraged folk, he did it with the kindness that God had given him. When he sat with beggars and thieves and all the Sadducees and Pharisees, and why, they, why is he sitting with them? Jesus sat down so he could lift them up. The hands which hold a person down cannot hold you down unless they get down there with you. Did you know that? No one can hold you down unless they get down with you. But the right person that get down with you can lift you up. See, the problem with so many people and so many homes and even in the church today is that we want to tear people down just to get up by ourselves. But if you really want to lift somebody up, lift them up in the name of Jesus Christ. Just as Christ restored the paralytic man back to normalcy, we should be doing the same thing. Don't you know that God is doing the same thing in your life right now? He is giving you permission to do the impossible. It doesn't matter what people say. It's all about what Christ is going to do. But when you lift somebody up, you do a far much better thing for them than you ever realize. I've been married to my wife 34 years and, and, and she, used, she always encouraged me to do more than what I've ever done. I'm, I'm here today to tell you that if I did not have a praying wife, I don't know where I would be today. She would get up in the morning and, and say, are you going to church? And, and I said, no, I'm not going to church today. And for five years straight, she asked the same question. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Are you going to church? And for five years, I gave her the same response. But one day, she said, are you going to church? I said, yeah, give me a few minutes to put some clothes on. And from that one day, I joined the church. And from that one day, I found myself singing in a choir, knowing I can't sing. But that constant encouragement to come to church, to come to God, stayed with me all these years. It was time to straighten up. A lot of the things I was doing in my life, back then wasn't pleasing to God. Now, y'all y'all been there. Yes, you, 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 you had a past. Amen? Amen? And a lot of the things that you did, you, you, you needed to straighten out sooner than when you did. Amen. See, Amen. When, you, when you really look at what God is doing in your life, you didn't get here by chance. Amen. You didn't just show up on the church door. Some of us came 
us an action to it. Act like you got something to do. And then he told him to do something else. He said, pick up your bed. What you lay in your head. Pick up whatever you got that's yours. And take it with you once you start walking with me. So he picked up just his bed. He didn't pick up somebody else's bed. He didn't pick up somebody else's problem. He just says, I'm going to straighten up. I'm just getting what belongs to me. Problem with folks when they try to get right. Is they take too many problems that's not theirs into their new life. I just saw my twin brother this weekend. And I said, he said, man, we came in there together. And before he could say another word, I said, we're not leaving here on a buddy buddy plan. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, no, 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 no. You might check out before I do. Uh uh. There's a few things I still want to do yeah. from the Lord. Yeah. And, and he said to me, he said, he said, Brian, now my brother going through a hard time. He lost his wife last year. Mm -hmm. He said, everywhere I go, I see her. Yeah. He said, e every time I try to cook a meal, it don't taste right. Yeah. He said, because it don't taste like what she did. Yeah. He said, so, so, so how am I supposed to just pick up and, and move on. Mm. I said, first of all, you got to get part of God and remember the happy times yeah. you had with her. Yeah. But you got to get up yeah. and move on. Yeah. See, so many times people get stuck yeah. in a moment in time yeah. and they can't straighten up. Yeah. Point number two. Time to make a, make a straight path. The analogy of a physical paralytic man being healed by spiritual means was uncommon. Uh -huh. In a sense, a proper direction is seen as a command. Yeah. They should walk in a straight direction toward maturity in Christ. Now, let me be the first one to tell you. Just because you've been coming to church all your life don't mean you mature yet. Yeah. I'm not saying that you are not where you should be. You are where you are by what you've done. When you think about the path that you want to live, you can't serve Christ and the devil at the same time. Now, 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 some, somebody not going to like this. But when I gave my life to Christ. I, I told my wife we're going to live a certain way. My wife looked at me with those pretty brown eyes. She said, God called you. He didn't call me. I'll get there when I get there. She helped me make my path straight. Then I had to turn around and help make her path straight. You never know what God is doing in you that's going to help somebody else. When I chose this Christian walk, I went all the way back to Chicago trying to find somebody to tell me that the path that was in front of me was not the right path. I went to Chicago to my pastor, Pastor Johnny Henderson. And mm -hmm. I said, Pastor, I think I've been called into the ministry. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I gave him every excuse. I said, but here's the real reason why I can't be no minister. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what is it? I said, I can't sing. <laughs> he said, you, you can't what? <laughs> I said, I can't sing. He said, that's good. God didn't call you to sing. He called you to preach. I thought that was the end of it. But then on the way home, I called up a friend. Now, if it was done in the street, me and him did it together. I'm not glorifying my son of past, but I'm just telling you the truth. And I said, man, look, get over here. 
I need to talk to you. And he pulled up and I left out the house and went into the car. And I said, look, man, I think God has called me to preach. He took out a pack of Newports, and you know how you do a pack of Newports, don't you? <laughs> Popped the pack, took one out, and he lit it. He said, well, that's good. I said, what? He said, you may be the one to help save my soul. My path was in front of me. And as many times as I found out that no matter where I went, I couldn't escape it. When God has called you to do something, you will not get no peace until you do it. Food won't even taste good for you no more. You'll have more sleepless night and you slept 10 hours a day. You'll wake up more tired than you ever thought you could be. It's not until you do what Christ is telling you to do. Choosing a straight path. An aggressive pursuit of that kind of peace. With God's holiness should motivate folks. Sometimes I think I spend more time motivating folks than I should. Motivation is good. But I learned one thing about motivation. It cannot be given to you. Motivation is something you have to have within yourself. This is a position of holiness and sanctification imputed in your conversion. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 state that the pursuit should be of a practical, manifested state. Time to get a right attitude. Right. Amen. Now, Sister Marshall can tell you that I gave these titles to these sermons a month ago, a month and a half ago, and each one I give up will last us all the way to the end of the year. Every sermon you'll see, she posts them on Facebook. They've already been planned out. Right. And when I saw what I saw in verse number 12, Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. Do you see anybody in there with you? This is personal. So that what is lame may not be put out of joint. I don't know about y'all, but I know a lot of folks that have bad knees, bad backs, shoulders. I used to be a painter for 30 years, and I wore this rotator cuff out. And sometimes I have to just get up in the morning and push it against a wall for it to go right back where it needs to be. But all the pain that's associated with getting it back right is for my good. They said, well, why would you have the surgery? I said, God been working with this shoulder for 53 years. He can keep working with the same shoulder. So long as I can pick up a spoon to mouth, I'm all right. See, if it ain't messed up, don't, don't, don't go around fixing it. My mother had back surgery, and she said that was the worst thing she ever did. But you got to have the right attitude. My attitude as far as letting folks go to cut on me is not there yet. you got to have the right attitude. And basically what it means is to look diligently at the situation. Some folks have good attitudes. Some folks have bad. Bad. Did I say bad? Attitude? As soon as they start talking, you say, oh, time to go. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a person that every time you talk to them is negative? Yeah. Negative? Yeah. Negative? Yeah. Don't you got any happy praises in your mouth? Yeah. 
And every time, oh, here she comes, she's gonna tell me about her husband <laughs> and how kids ain't acting right. That's your bad attitude. Help the sister. Don't complain about it. Help her. First, a lack of appreciation keeps you from an appropriate situation. A lack of appreciation keeps you from an appropriate situation. A person with a bad attitude would talk themselves out of some good blessings. You ever met a person that said, you know, I ain't got nothing and I ain't, I ain't never gonna have nothing? Well, I was just about to bless you, but you messed that up. Complaining all the time. And here's the thing with a bad attitude. It does nothing but create strife and bitterness. I know we have hard times. We've talked about that. I know there are situations in our life that are out of our control. But if we live it for Christ, we should be able to go through it with some type of joy and gladness. And they say, Pastor, well, well, I just lost a loved one. Well, remember the joy that you had with that loved one. Amen. Remember the peace that you had. How much fun times did you have? When, it's, when sometimes when it's hard for some people to let go, it's because they didn't treat that person the way they should have treated them before they left. And so now the attitude is all messed up. The second part of this is to help them to understand that the root of bitterness springs up within their own spirit. You can read that in Deuteronomy 29 and 18. Do you not know that sometimes the bitterness in your heart is there by your own making that you create bitterness? Every time you ask, you, you look and there's nothing you're happy about? See, here's what happened. Paul was talking to the church of Corinthians and every person he talked to seemed so depressed about what was going on in their life. And they weren't happy about nothing. How can you live a life in Christ and not have no happiness? Not happy about anything. I'm happy about the peanut butter sandwich he gave me. I'm happy about the roof over my head that he gave me. I'm happy about the regular clothes he gave me. I'm happy that my kids are doing just fine no matter where they are. I'm happy about that. So what? I ain't got a million dollars. I'm glad with the two dollars I got. I'm happy about that. So what? I, I don't have big screen TV. Guess what? That 19 inch doing me just fine. Guess what? I'm happy with when God wake me up in the morning. I'm happy when He lay me down at night. See, I'm not gonna be better about what God gave me. God gave me another day that He didn't have to give me. So I ain't got no reason. I ain't never gonna tell 
everybody leave their spouse. How you gonna do that? That man or woman might have a grudge. But it, life doesn't have to be bitter. Look at what verse 15 says. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Let me tell you what's happening right there. That's for the people that fail to accept God as God and Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Those are, are unbelievers. That no root of bitterness spring up and cause what? Trouble. Don't let bitterness spring up and cause trouble in your life. And here's the last point. It's time to make a choice. It's time to make a choice. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was praying to the Father. He sat there and he told God, his father, he said, if it's your will, I pray that you let this cup pass from me. If it was a bitter cup, I can imagine our Savior taking. It was a bitter cup of all that he was going to have to endure for our souls. It was a bitter cup that he was going to have to hang on an old rugged cross. But it was a bitter cup that he gave up the ghost and rose with all power in his hands. But early Sunday morning, a bitter cup turned into a sweet cup. A bitter cup brought joy with his Sunday morning. Sunday morning. A bitter cup brought salvation Sunday morning. A bitter cup brought another day for me and you. A bitter cup did what you couldn't do. A bitter cup made my dark days bright. A bitter cup made me raise my aching head. A bitter cup made a sweet cup mighty to me. See, now when I look at my life, even though I went through some trials and troubles, I had my head hung down low. Now my bitter days are all gone. Now I can lift up my head and I can say how sweet it is, how sweet it is that a bitter cup turned into a sweet cup. See, I know